is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Blood of Elves, The Witcher, Book One, Chapter Four. In this chapter, our enchantress gets really, really sick. And I have to say, I'm pretty suspicious that one of the witchers poisoned her or something. Secondly, we uh, wind up with a convoy that gets attacked and it turns out it was all a setup. And I'm really sad because, like, somebody's dead. Somebody that people liked. This is overall a bummer. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Many thanks to Melanie for commissioning this episode. Um, so I, first of all, want to let you know that if you hear a cat purring, that is likely my kitten that is laying right here. Secondly, um, it has been a little while since the last Witcher episode, so I want to catch you all up to speed that um, we have this little girl, Siri, who is part of the crew at um, Kaer Morin, I believe is how you say it, um, where this little girl was a princess that was part of a, basically a payment plan um, for Geralt to take her as a potential witcher in the future. Um, it turns out that she she is pretty good at the witcheriness but being a girl with a bunch of dudes who have never trained a girl to be a witcher, uh, they don't know what they're doing and they don't handle this super well. So Triss, who is an enchantress, um, she is, she comes looking for Geralt and realizes that this little girl really needs to be with somebody who knows how to raise a female human and they are heading out at the end of the last chapter. Now I reread part of this past chapter and Melanie, I'm going to need you to refresh me on this because I could not nail down the reason why they decide to leave Care Moore. And I don't know where I don't, I went and reread it. And this is part of the problem of having like a long space between chapters is um, then it turns into having to read twice um, because I don't remember what, where they're heading now, but whatever the case, they run into a lot of trouble on their way. And most of it starts off with Triss getting sick. I cannot say, <laughs> I have to, I have to admire this author for being like, all right, we're going to have this beautiful enchantress get sick. What shall we have her get sick with? And I feel like for a lot of male writers, if they're going to have a female character get sick, it's going to be something that's like vaguely um, aesthetic. But he's giving her an illness in which she is about to shit herself to death. And you know what? I appreciate that because that is not glamorous. There's nothing sexy about it. It's just awful. And it's interesting to me because she is not willing to answer when Geralt asks her if she is immune to things like dysentery because apparently magicians should be like, he says something about, aren't you immune? And he says later when they run into the caravan for the King, he says that they don't need to worry about it being a, what's the word I want? Contagious disease because magicians aren't susceptible to that kind of thing. And I can't tell he's obviously lying to them about whether it can be or not in Triss's case, but I can't tell if he's lying in general about the fact that they're immune or if that's just sort of a, um, old wives tale or something that people have like believed about the magicians that turns out to be kind of unsubstantiated or what. Um, 
Melanie says they can't control her power and are in search of some place and someone that can help her better. I need a refresh too. Okay, cool. That's right. Because she's going into these like weird trances and they're starting to get pretty worried about like the effects of them and whether or not, I think there's like a suspicion amongst them that there is something that is trying to like get through. Um, and they're worried that this thing could potentially like take control of this little girl is what I think I remember, but we'll see. All right. So she's talking to Geralt. Um, he asks her about all of these different like, um, elixirs that are in her case. And he thinks that he can feed her one of these and it'll make her feel better. And she says that she can't take them. She's allergic. I always have been. I can't tolerate elixirs. I can treat others with them, but I can only treat myself with amulets. And he asks, where is the amulet? And she says, I don't know. I must have left it in Care Morin or lost it. All right. I'm going to share some skepticism here. I don't think this bitch lost or forgot something that was that important. I feel like she's been set up. I don't trust these guys that were at Care More, and I trust a couple of them, but there's that one dude who like always just had a problem with her and I just I'm I'm hyper suspicious. So I just feel like this whole illness has been orchestrated by somebody. It seems by the end of this chapter like she's gonna be okay. I'm not sure if that was the plan, if they intended her to die. Or if they just were trying to sideline Geralt and her and Siri or what. But it, it, what it comes down to in the end is just that I really believe that somebody is trying to hurt her on purpose. So that's where I'm, that's my uh, theory at the moment. And I am sticking to it. Um, so things continue to get worse. She's like really pale and sweating and just like, you know, and then eventually she comes down with a fever and it is pretty bad. She starts to hallucinate at one point. She's talking to herself. She's talking to people who aren't there. It's pretty brutal, you know, and I'm wondering what, if any significance, some of the things that she's like talking about in her hallucinations are going to have. Um, but yeah, here's the, Geralt, the cramps, they're nothing. But if I run a fever, it could be dysentery or paratyphoid. Aren't you immune? Triss turned her head away without replying, bit her lip, and curled up even tighter. The witcher did not pursue the question. So the way that he says, aren't you immune, as if he has like taken it for granted, that that couldn't possibly be what she's suffering from. And her having to be like, it isn't even that she says, yeah, it could be. She just doesn't answer him. I'm wondering if this, if it's just something, do the enchanters, magicians, whatever, keep up this sort of myth that they cannot be taken down by this sort of illness in order to further a feeling of like admiration. And she's realizing that she's sort of like outed herself as being just as vulnerable as anybody. Um, I'm curious about what the understanding is amongst common people with this. And if Geralt made his own assumptions or if this is widely believed or what, or if maybe Triss is for some reason an exception to a rule that is true normally, you know, that could be it too. Um, so she winds up sitting in front of Geralt on his horse and he's trying to hold her up because she cannot keep in the saddle. And even when he is behind her, holding her in place, he, she can't stay sitting upright. She keeps falling down. So this, this moment, um, Ger Geralt told himself that it was an allergic reaction to the traces of magic in his wicks, witcher's elixir. He told himself that, but he did not believe it. So this leads me to believe that Geralt thinks that she was poisoned also. I think he has his suspicions and that he, that whoever did this knows that she uses this amulet and took it out of her bag or whatever. So Geralt is trying to find some help and they come across this little fort guarding a bridge. Normally there would be all kinds of people here that could help a little, a little at the moment. However, 
they have just been attacked and things are really bad. And they basically have come at like the worst possible time. Um, the fort guarding the bridge where there would usually be three soldiers, a stable boy, a toll collector, and at most a few passersby was swarming with people. The Witcher counted over 30 lightly armed soldiers wearing the colors of Caedwin and a good 50 shield bearers camping around the low palisade. Most of them were lying by campfires in keeping with the old soldier's rule, which dictates that you sleep when you can and get up when you're woken. Considerable activity could be seen through the thrown open gates. There were a lot of people and horses inside the fort, too. At the top of the little leaning lookout tower, two soldiers were on duty, with their crossbows permanently at the ready. On the worn bridge trampled by horses' hooves, six peasant carts and two merchant wagons were parked. In the enclosure, their heads lowered sadly over mud and manure, stood umpteen unyoked oxen. There was an assault on the fort last night, the sergeant anticipated his question. We, got, we just got here in time with the relief troops, otherwise we'd have found nothing here but charred earth. Who were your attackers? Bandits? Marauders? The soldier shook his head, spat, and looked at Siri and Triss huddled in the saddle. Come inside, he said. Your enchantress is going to fall out of her saddle any minute now. We already have some wounded men there. One more won't make much difference. In the yard, in an open roofed shelter, lay several people with their wounds dressed with bloodied bandages. A little further between the palisade fence and wooden well, with a, with a sweep, Geralt made out six still bodies wrapped in sacking from which only pairs of feet and worn dirty boots protruded. So, it's a pretty bad situation. And it turns out that, and I really enjoy the fact that, like, in any story like this, there's going to be a need for some exposition on what exactly the fuck is going on. And it's really convenient for this story that we have Siri here to ask a lot of questions and just generally be like, wait, what? How does that make sense? How does that work? Like, I just really enjoyed how she is our sort of surrogate within this part of the story. Not the whole story, because Siri sure has some knowledge and some abilities that none of us have that makes her utterly unrelatable at times. But at least for this, I really appreciated it. So it turns out that those who attacked were elves and they're called, and I'm going to butcher this, so please forgive me ahead of time. Scoia'tael. I have no idea if I'm saying that right. It's spelled S-C-O-I-A apostrophe T-A-E-L. Uh, no shit. Melanie says I nailed it. Melanie, are you just saying that to be nice? Because I'm pretty sure I just invented that. <laughs> um, the Scoia tale is, uh, it means squirrels in Elvish. And this guy, this soldier says, some say... It's because they sometimes wear squirrel tails on their fur caps and hats. Others say it's because they live in the woods and eat nuts. Um, they're getting more and more troublesome. So we have this moment where it becomes pretty clear that this soldier is a racist. Racist is such a weird word to use in this sort of sense, but it's really accurate because they are of an entirely different race. One could argue that saying racist in this context is more accurate than saying racist in our, you know, present day context. Um, but he says he just basically feels like the, the one of the quotes that ended the previous chapter was the only good elf is a dead elf. And he is certainly somebody who subscribes to that line of thinking. Um, so this, this knight is just, first of all, he knows who Geralt is. Um, I've heard of you and not just from gossip and hearsay. What brings you here? You've not come at a good time or to a good place. A band of Scoia'tael is doing the rounds and there was a skirmish yesterday. I'm waiting here for relief forces, and then we'll start a counterattack. You're fighting elves? Not just elves. Is it possible? Have you not heard of the squirrels? No, I haven't. 
Well, here in Caedwin, the Scoia tale had made sure everybody's talking about them. They've seen it only too well. The first bands appeared just after the war when with Nilfgaard broke out. The cursed non-humans took advantage of our difficulties. We were fighting in the south, and they began a guerrilla campaign at our rear. They counted on the Nilfgaardians, defeating us, started declaring it was the end of human rule and there would be a return to the old order. Humans to the sea! That's their battle cry, as they murder, burn, and plunder. It's your own fault and your own problem, the grieve commented glumly, tapping his thigh with the notched stick, a mark of his position. Yours and all the other noblemen and knights. You're the ones who oppressed the non-humans, would not allow them their way of life, so now you pay for it. While we've always moved goods this way and no one stopped us, we didn't need an army. Um, which leads to an argument between everybody on whether or not they are, whether or not historically this guy is accurate, at this point they feel it doesn't matter how it started. What matters is that they are still trying to kill people. And, you know, I understand that from a practical standpoint, but I do have this like, you know, intrinsic uh, sort of instinct to side with the indigenous people. Now, what's interesting is that we find out later the elves are not necessarily indigenous people. And I found this really compelling. And I'm not entirely sure if this is something that was consciously mimicked by George R.R. R. Martin, but he has this whole thing with like the um, children of the forest being there first and then the uh, Andals coming and then eventually the Targaryens coming in and like taking over. So there's like a three step sort of, and that's what we wind up finding out is kind of the case here. The gnomes were actually like the very first race, followed pretty quickly by the dwarves. And then they were like the two bigger races, the more dominant races. And eventually, about a thousand years ago, the elves showed up. So and, and they showed up on ships. And we are reminded in um, a talk between, I can't remember his name, Yandel um, and Siri, that nobody has ever mapped the entire world in this universe. So there's all kinds of lands and things that nobody knows, like where they are or how far or what's beyond, you know, X, Y, and Z piece of land or mountain range. So these elves coming to the, the shores of this land are colonizers in their way, but they colonized a thousand years ago. So they try at this point to align themselves with the dwarves and gnomes and act like we're all in this together, buddies. We're all indigenous. And the gnomes and dwarves are kind of like, listen, like we would like to accept your help but also you're not really one of us and you acted like you were so much better than us until you were being attacked by humans and all of a sudden needed our help. And now we're all buddies and friends and we're all in the same boat together. Oh, isn't that convenient? And uh, I couldn't help but appreciate that because it feels really true. And I was going to say true to human nature, but they're not human, but you know what I mean. Um, this idea of superiority until you need to team up. Um, one could argue that's how the Democratic Party can be with uh, black folks, isn't it? We're going to be separate until we really, really need your help. Um, Melanie says, much like the conversations of the first chapter, there's a lot of nationalistic conflict. Yeah, I think I'm being surprised pretty consistently in this story by how many different uh, conflicts there are like it, all different stages and all different scales. And I keep thinking that there's going to be a pretty clear line drawn between the races. But as we find out that there in this chapter, there's a dwarf who is on the side of the king. And basically he is because he feels like each of these races is trying to like snuff the other out. Neither of them is going to manage to do that. The elves are impossible to catch and human beings fuck all the time. 
and keep multiplying. And there's just no way. So we need to figure out a way to work and live together. And they just keep acting like, well, we'll just eliminate them. And then we won't have to worry about cooperating. And he's like, you won't be able to eliminate them. This is how it is. He's very practical, but his practicality singles him out from his race because they see him as a sort of a traitor. And it turns out that there's like multiple people who think that he might be a traitor, but we'll get to that later. Um, so then we have this conversation, going back to this conversation between the knight and the guys that, uh, that Geral is talking to. Um, we are protecting your mangy skin, Grieve, from those, as you call them, oppressed elves, who, according to you, we did not let live. But I will say something different. We have emboldened them too much. We tolerated them, treated them as humans, as equals, and now they're stabbing us in the back. Nilfgaard is paying them for it, I'd stake my life, and the savage elves from the mountains are furnishing them with arms. But their real support comes from those who always lived among us, from the elves, half-elves, dwarves, gnomes, and halflings. They are the ones who are hiding them, feeding them, supplying them with volunteers. Um, and somebody steps in and says, no, most of them actually condemn the squirrels and have nothing to do with them. Um, and they want to have nothing to do with them and they're very loyal. Um, the majority of them are loyal and sometimes pay a high price for that loyalty. Remember the Burgomaster from Bannard? He was a half-elf who urged peace and cooperation. He was killed by an assassin's arrow. Aimed, no doubt, by a neighbor, some halfling or dwarf who also feigned loyalty. If you ask me, none of them are loyal. Which, like, you know, okay, guy, calm down. This dude is very, uh, like, all or nothing. And I enjoy how this is written because he really gets across that everybody's sort of tired of this dude. Like, you really get the impression that he makes this speech like a couple times a day and everybody's really sick and tired of hearing it. Um, so at this point, Siri pops up and is just kind of observing and everybody's like, Whoa, where did she come from? She's, she's pulling an aria. Um, and he continues with his speech about how like they can seem like they're loyal, but it's just because they are, like most of them are better at pretending to be loyal than otherwise. Um, and the witcher says, how large are these units? Bands, corrected the knight. They're bands, witcher. They can count up to a hundred heads, sometimes more. They call each pack a commando. It's a word borrowed from the gnomes. And in saying they're hard to catch, you speak truly. Evidently, you're a professional. Chasing them through the woods and thickets is senseless. The only way to cut them off from their is to cut them off from their supplies, isolate them, and starve them out. Seize the non-humans who are helping them firmly by the scruff of their necks. Um, and the the merchant who keeps on sort of defending the halflings is like, well, we don't know who's helping them and who's not. And the knight is like. Did I just say that we should fucking take them all down? Yes, I did. We don't need to know who's helping them and who's not. We'll just seize them all. <sighs> so basically, he's just, yeah, he's hugely racist and is like, if he could start some camps, I have a feeling he would be all about it. Um, so this whole thing is a a really like complex web because this guy thinks that they're like teamed up with Nilfgaard. And I'm not totally sure why, like what Nilfgaard stands to gain exactly by teaming up with the elves in the end. Um, but I have a suspicion that like this, this conspiracy theory and, and paranoia that this guy has doesn't need to be substantiated with actual logic. He just seems like that type. So um, so somebody finally interrupts this conversation and asks, okay, who brought this chick that's sick? And he, this guy has tried to help Triss by giving her actual medicine that she can tolerate instead of these elixirs that she says she's allergic to. And he gave her fire water with pepper and saltpeter, which I guess fire water is something like whiskey, I would guess. 
or a vodka or, you know, whatever. Um, but obviously this did not agree with her any better than anything else, which I find sort of like, I'm, I'm really wondering what exactly this is that has made her so like made it so impossible for anything to have the slightest effect on her. Like I'm, ah, I just think that she's been poisoned. I just do, you know? Um, the magician doubled over was clear evidence of the fact that the fire water and with pepper and saltpeter was not something her stomach could tolerate. It could be some plague or that what's it called? Zintery. I love that he doesn't know how to say dysentery. If it were to spread to our men, she's a wizard, protested the witcher. Wizards don't fall sick. Just so, the knight who had followed them out threw in cynically. Yours, as I see, is just emanating good health. Um, and I can't help but think that him trying, like, constantly to be like, no, 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 it's fine, is more suspicious than anything. I'd be pretty, like, if I were this knight, frankly, I'd be pretty suspicious of Geralt. But that's because I start to be really paranoid about everybody when... I think about putting myself in the position where there's potential spies or setups or whatever. Um, and he calls Siri this brat. I love this moment so much. Siri, who was trying to clean her dung smeared boot on a ladder rung, raised her head. The knight cleared his throat and looked down. Geralt smiled faintly. Over the last two years, Ciri had almost forgotten her origins and had almost entirely lost her royal manners and airs. But her glare, when she wanted, was very much like that of her grandmother. So much so that Queen Calanthe would no doubt have been very proud of her granddaughter. Yes, what I, what was I, the knight stammered, tugging at his belt with embarrassment. <laughs> oh shit, I love this. She looks at him like, a bitch, excuse me? Did I just hear you correctly? Did you, did your ass just call me a brat? Hmm. This cat is starting to lose it. I'm going to put her down, everybody. Go play. You little monster. Um, so, yeah. He says that there is a caravan that's following the trail and that it's probably stopping to rest. And maybe they will have somebody with them who can, you know, who's a, um, a better medic than the guy that they've got with them that tried to give her saltpeter. So maybe they could do something for her. Um, so they head out there and Geralt is really, really careful upon approaching this caravan to announce his presence by like, jingling his uh, reins and letting his horse make noise because he is aware that they're going to be on the alert for like a sneak attack. And if they don't let people know really far ahead that they're coming, it's going to seem like they are trying to catch them unawares and that they could easily be uh, skewered by some crossbow bolts if they are not careful about this. Um, who goes there? A friend, the witcher dismounted. I wonder whose, growled the dwarf. Come closer. Hold your hands out so we can see them. Closer. Either my eyes deceive me, or it's the witcher, Geralt of Rivia, or someone who looks damn like him. The fire suddenly shot up into flames, bursting into a golden brightness which drew faces and figures from the dark. Yarpen Zigrin, declared Geralt, astonished. None other than Yarpin Zagrin in person, complete with beard. Ha! The dwarf waved his axe as if it were an osier twig. The blade whirred in the air and cut into a stump with a dull thud. Call the alarm off. This truly is a friend. Welcome, you warlock. Wherever you've come from and wherever you're going, welcome. Boys, over here. You remember my boys, Witcher? This is Yannick Brass, this one's Xavier Moran, and here's Paulie Dalberg and his brother Regan. Geralt didn't remember any of them, and besides, they all looked alike, beardy, stocky, practically square in their thick quilted jerkins. There were six of you, if I remember correctly. 
There were six of us indeed, but Lucas Corto got married and settled down in Mahakim and dropped out of the company, the stupid oaf. Um, so, this is fun. I enjoy the fact that he, like, knows this guy, that this is some familiarity. It kind of, really, the reason that I'm glad he knows him is that it cuts back on the amount of time that we have to spend being suspicious of one another. Because that's the danger with something like this, is that I don't want to, like, have to read through all the tediousness of, who are you? How do I know you are who you say you are? Are you blah, blah, blah? But I also don't want them to completely, like, trust one another right away either. So having them know each other, this is very helpful. Um, and Geralt is, ta like, telling him about the illness that, the, uh, that Triss is suffering from. And Yarpin is able to, I think it's Yarpin, right, that puts together these little pills that he talks about are made of mold and garlic and, you know, antibiotics. Like, garlic is an antibiotic. Honey is as well. Um, and, of course, the bread mold. That's how it was discovered for us as well. So they're making, like, these little balls of it, which smell terrible. And they are, are basically going to have to shove them down her throat. But she's like, she knows that this is probably going to work. So it's not like Triss is being resistant to this. If anything, Geralt's the one who's like, uh, you're not going to make her eat that. And Triss is like, shut the fuck up. It's going to help. Get out of the way. And I appreciated that a lot. Um, and there is this like kind of adorable relationship that uh, springs up between Yarpin and Siri. Um I'm called Yarpin Zagrin, and what are you called, little goose? Something other than little goose, snarled Siri with a gleam in her eye. The dwarf chuckled and bared his teeth. Ah, I beg you forgiveness. I didn't recognize you in the darkness. This isn't a goose, but a noble lady. I fall at your feet. What is the young lady's name, if it's no secret? Um, it's no secret. I'm Siri. Siri. Aha. And who is the young lady? That, Siri turned her nose up proudly, is a secret. Um, and they kind of go back and forth snarky until he mentions something about having medicine for Triss. And Siri is realizing that she's sort of giving this guy a hard time when they really need his help. And maybe she should dial it back a little bit. So then she sort of apologizes. And they start to make these thing, these little pellets and they're talking also about like their history with getting beaten by people who were looking after them. And he's talking about his grandmother and how like awful she was. And I love that he says at one point that she like gave him bread that had like butter and sugar on it. And he was so surprised at her being nice to him for once that he dropped it, which of course led her to beating him again. It's a really a uh, heartwarming tale. <laughs> um, so, Let's see. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, Yarpin, do you have any angelica or saffron? I'll have a look and ask around. I brought you some water and a little food. I'll just make up a compress for Triss. Um, and at this point, uh, Geralt is like, all right, we're going to need to talk. Um, because I want to know what convoy this is, what you're doing. And Yarpin's basically like, hey, uh, none of your business. I know that because we're friends, you think that you can just ask me about what I'm doing for the king, but you can't. I'm not going to tell you. So maybe just be cool and drop it. And of course, Geralt like kind of doesn't. He does for the moment, but he brings it up a couple more times. Um, this guy, Wenk, is the one who's actually in charge here. And Wenk is only kind of agreeing, and I'm going to get to this part. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Garrett was just settling Triss down next, uh, next to her, having brought her in from another enforced expedition to the woods. The rugs cocooning the enchantress sparkled with dew, which sounds really pretty, but is super uncomfortable. Um, Geralt, are they going to let us travel in the wagon? We'll see. Sleep while you can, um, while you can, and rest. So, Wenk 
has a deal that he wants to strike. He takes these long pauses between sentences when he talks, which I kind of enjoy, like as infuriating as it would be to be on the receiving end of that. It's a real power move, like leaving long pauses and making sure that everybody is so like engrossed or waiting for you and not interested in interrupting that you can like leave those pauses and people will just go with it. Um, so he says, one can come across certain evil creatures in Caduan forests lately incited by other evil creatures. They could jeopardize our safety. King Henselt, knowing this, empowered me to recruit volunteers to join our armed escort. Geralt, that would solve your little problem. The witcher's silence lasted a long while, longer than Wenk's entire speech, interspersed though it had been with regular pauses. No, he said finally. No, Wenk, let us put this clearly. I am prepared to repay the help given Lady Marigold, but not in this manner. I can groom the horses, carry water and firewood, even cook, but I will not enter the king's service as a soldier. Please don't count on my sword. I have no intention of killing those, as you call them, evil creatures on the order of other creatures whom I do not consider to be any better. Siri heard Yarpin Zagrin hiss loudly and cough into his rolled up sleeve. I see. I like clear situations. All right, then. Zagrin, see to it that the speed of our progress, progress does not slow. As for you, Geralt, I know you will prove to be useful and helpful in a way you deem fit. It would be an affront to both of us if I were to treat your good stead as payment for aid offered to a suffering woman. Is she feeling better today? Um, so he tries to make it like that this is going to be the deal that they strike. But in the end, he's just kind of like... All right. I mean, if you'll agree to do some other stuff, I'd really prefer it if you'd agree to fight on our side, but what are you going to do? As it turns out, when push comes to shove, Geralt is willing to fight for their side. Um, and he, I mean, all right, I'm getting ahead of myself. So Triss is starting to get better. Um, we have a conversation between Siri and Yarpin um, where... Well, first we have Geralt talking with Yarpin about Yennefer. And this is kind of painful. Like, apparently Yarpin doesn't know about Geralt's history with Yennefer. I have to say, I'm not entirely sure if I buy that or if I think that he's sort of needling Geralt on purpose. But whatever the case, Geralt is not interested in continuing this conversation. Um, so let's see. Oh, here it is. Oh, yes. So, you know, that's what I've decided. Quieter, said the witcher calmly. There's a sick woman in this wagon. I'm not criticizing your decisions or your resolutions. No, of course not. You're just smiling knowingly about them. Yarpin, I'm warning you as one friend to another. Both sides despise those who sit on the fence. I'm not sitting. I'm unambiguously declaring myself to be on one side. But you'll always remain a dwarf for that side, someone who's different, an outsider. While for the other side, he broke off. Well, growled Yarpin, turning away. Well, go on, what are you waiting for? Call me a traitor and a dog on a human leash who for a handful of silver and a bowl of lousy food is prepared to be set against his rebelling kinsmen who are fighting for freedom. Go on, spit it out. I don't like insinuations. No, I'm not going to spit anything out. Oh, you don't feel like it? You prefer to stare and smile? Oh, not a word to me, but you could say it to Wenk. Please don't count on my sword. So haughty, noble, and proud. Shove your haughtiness up a dog's ass and your bloody pride with it. I just wanted to be honest. I don't want to get mixed up in this conflict. I want to remain neutral. It's impossible, yelled Yarpin. It's impossible to remain neutral. Don't you understand that? No, you don't understand anything. Oh, get off my wagon, get on your horse, and get out of my sight with your arrogant neutrality. You get on my nerves. Listen, Yarpin ain't wrong. Hashtag Team Yarpin. I'm just... I, at this point in my life, have so much less tolerance for this kind of shit than I used to. 
Granted, this situation that's going on with these elves and all this is weird and I don't understand all of the history behind it. So I'm not going to say that specifically in this situation, I think that the Witcher should be on the king's side. I'm just saying that this desire for neutrality is a pipe dream and that's just not fucking realistic. That's not life, you know, like the shit doesn't work like that. It'd be so nice if we could all just remain outside of shit. But that's not how it goes, you know, and I just really have my tolerance for this kind of talk and desire to just, quote, agree to disagree has all but evaporated. As far as I'm concerned, if you are not willing to stand up to people who take us like the wrong side on something that is based like about basic rights and freedoms of an entire group of people, I just can't fuck with you. I just can't do it. Like you are, in my opinion, tacitly endorsing whatever it is that these like enemies of yours are saying if you don't come out right against it. So this whole attitude that he has and the feeling that obviously Siri has a little bit later I am 100% in agreement on Siri and Yarpin forever. So <laughs> this point, he starts yelling at Siri because she comes up and sits with him and he's like, Oh yeah. And fuck you too. Because since you're a little girl, now I have to get down from the wagon in order to piss and I can't just do it off the side, which is way more convenient, which is a weird thing that I didn't really think of, but like how nice would it be to just be able to like, piss off to the side as you're continuing the wagon and not have to get out. Like that's a pretty sweet deal. Um, but yeah, so he almost, um, he almost runs into a log that is like across the way. And if he had hit it, he would have really fucked up the cart, like the axles. He probably would have broken the wheels and everybody's sort of like mad at him that he just barely missed it. She tries to like take credit for it. She says something like, if it weren't for me, what might have run over the log? Um, if you'd been in the middle of pissing from the box and ridden onto that log, well, well. Which I'm like, all right, you know, like I like your moxie. I like that you're taking credit for this, but also it's kind of bullshit. But I'm not even like mad at you for it. Um, so what does it mean to remain neutral, to be indifferent? What's indifferent? Indifferent to what? If the Skoya tail attack us, your Geralt intends to stand by and look calmly on as they cut our throats. You'll probably stand next to him because it'll be a demonstration class. Today's subject, the witcher's behavior in the face of conflict between intelligent races. I don't understand. That doesn't surprise me in the least. Is that why you quarreled with him and were angry? Who are these Skoyatil anyway? These squirrels. Siri. These aren't matters for the minds of little girls. Um, there are dwarves too. It's not just elves. I know, said Yarpin sourly. And you're a dwarf. There's no doubt about that. So why are you afraid of the squirrels at seems they only fight humans. It's not so simple as that. He grew solemn, unfortunately. Now I know, she said suddenly. The squirrels are fighting for freedom, and although you're a dwarf, you're the king, you're King Henselt's special secret servant on a human leash. You've got pretty good hearing, girl, like a marmot, but you're also a bit too bright for someone to, destined to give birth, cook, and spin. You think you know everything, don't you? That's because you're a brat. You've get grasped the nature of the Skowia tale quickly. You're, uh, you like the slogans. You know why you understand them so well? Because the Skowia tale are brats too. They're little snot heads who don't understand that they're being egged on, that someone's taking advantage of their childish stupidity by feeding them slogans about freedom. And at this point, Siri argues that they really are trying to fight for freedom. And this is when Yarpin tells her about how elves were here before humans, sure, but not like just like a thousand years earlier. Um, now they're competing with each other to offer us friendship. Suddenly we're all brothers. Um, 
and this and the talk about like how humans screw all the time gets her really uncomfortable and red in the face and finally Geralt kind of like comes up behind them and is like hey buddy I understand what you're trying to do and say maybe cool it on the language a little bit um have a care for Triss. Check if she's awake and needs anything. I've been awake for a long time, the magician said weakly from the depths of the wagon. But I didn't want to interrupt this interesting conversation. Don't disturb them, Geralt. I'd like to learn more about the role of screwing in the evolution of society. <laughs> I found that enjoyable. <laughs> um, so Triss is finally recovering and they're like heating up water for her in order to wash while everybody debates on whether or not she's washing a little too often. Maybe this isn't healthy. Um, and one of the guys is arguing about how some guy washed and then he died like a week later. And they're like, he was literally bit by a rabid animal. And he's like, yeah, well that rabid animal wouldn't have bit his ass if he wasn't clean. So there it is, which I love that line of thinking. It's my favorite. Um, and all right, so we have this moment with Yannick, who is uh, he, Yarpin, and all of these guys. It's hard for me to even like keep track of how this started. Um, they're talking about whether or not the Witcher is like involved with Triss, and it comes up again later because she is obviously. It's hard to tell if it's the illness speaking or if it's just that being ill has caused her guard to be like, is it, is it the same sort of thing as like when you have wine and all of a sudden you're telling people the truth about shit when you never intended to, or is this the kind of thing that is just kind of spilling out of her because it's, uh, uh because she's like borderline hallucinating still a little bit, but she is really trying to like, cling to Geralt and is like holding his arms and, and trying to hug him and apologizing about everything. Um, and she says, I so regret what happened between us. Um, I, that, that it should have, it should have happened now when I'm better, it would be entirely different. I could even, I envy Yennefer and Siri. Finally, Geralt is like, Siri, you need to leave because she's getting too out of control. And when Siri leaves, she runs into um, to Yarpin, who's basically like, you see that? Don't be like that. Don't make the mistake of thinking that just because somebody is being decent to you, that it means more than it does. Um, and she continues to press him on this whole thing with the Escoyotel. Um It's not giving you any peace, is it? Nor you, she said, nor any of the others. I can plainly see that. Who's right, the squirrels or you? Geralt wants to be neutral. You serve the king. The knight in the fort shouted, everybody's our enemy and everyone's got to be everyone, even the children. Who's right? I don't know, said the dwarf with some effort. I'm not omniscient. I'm doing what I think right. The squirrels have taken up their weapons and gone into the woods. Humans to the sea, they're shouting, not realizing that their catchy slogan was fed them by Nilfgaardian emissaries, not understanding that the slogan is not aimed at them, but plainly at humans, that it's meant to ignite human hatred, not fire young elves to battle. I understood. That's why I consider Squiatel's actions criminally stupid. What to do? Maybe in a few years' time I'll be called a traitor who sold out and they'll be heroes. Our history, the history of our world, has seen events turn out like that. Um, and then he says, Ilarina, if Ilarina was a hero, if what she did is heroism, then that's just too bad. Let them call me a traitor and a coward, because I, Yarpin Zagrin, coward, traitor, and renegade, state that we should not kill each other. I state that we ought to live. Live in such a way that we don't later have to ask anyone for forgiveness. The heroic Elerina, she had to ask, forgive me. She begged, forgive me. To hell with that. 
It's better to die than to live in the knowledge you've done something that needs forgiveness. Siri did not ask the question pressing to her lips. She instinctively felt that she should not. So to jump ahead a little bit here, um, we have this, this moment where the, what's the word? Cal caravan is interrupted by somebody who claims to be working for the King and demands to see like some sort of identification. Uh, Yarpin has a ring on. I think it's Yarpin that's wearing it. Right. Um, oh yeah. It's wank. Um, come closer and examine this ring. And then Yarpin like sort of threatens the guy. And try, and they all are sort of suspicious of the fact that this guy claims to work for the king, but doesn't like recognize the ring. The whole thing is just sort of sketchy right out of the gate. Um, he wants to inspect what they're carrying and make sure that there aren't humans that are being trafficked, which feels like a weird pretense, but okay. And he comes across Triss, who uses a spell to make herself like unnoticed by him and the same for C uh, Siri and Siri at this point, they're like continuing onward and she goes off at a flat out gallop and is thinking to herself about how Geralt is trying to remain neutral and how little she thinks of that. She is super unimpressed. Um, and she stops at one point when she reaches a spot where she's like out of the range of everybody. And she kind of has a little bit of a panic attack. She's got PTSD from what happened to her. And she keeps on like imagining it and comes back to herself and her palms are like wet and her face is covered in tears. And she realizes that like she's been crying and she doesn't even realize it. Um, And is thinking about how like, a witcher has to defend and save. That's the whole point. They're trying to teach me how to do this in order to what? Just stand by and watch? I'm never going to fucking do that. Um, and as she's sitting there, she sort of notices that there's like this weird soundlessness all of a sudden to the forest around her. And she hides and she sees a couple of elves that are passing by and believes that this is a, um, a, a party that is going to attack and wants to go back and warn them. The, the these are the Scoia tale. Um, and I don't understand why, but at this point, Geralt tells her, no, you can't tell anybody what we saw. And he leads her to this, um, this spot where there was a place called Sh 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 Oh, I can't say this one. Sherawed, um, which was a palace that the elves built. And he explains to her that um, they used to just abandon the castles and humans would build on the fan or the not castles, the palaces and towns and humans would build on those foundations. But they decided that they were going to start destroying them before they left um, because the whole like they what they thought was going on was that there were that this was a temporary insurgence of human beings and that they would just wait it out. And eventually the humans would destroy themselves and the elves would return to supremacy. Essentially. Um, they wanted to just weather the storm. And there was a woman named Ilarina and she stirred up the young and they took up arms and followed her into their last desperate battle. And they were massacred. And what he says is that basically only the young are fertile. They're the only ones who are able to reproduce. So when she gathered up all of their young and rode into battle and got them all killed, she essentially ensured that they would not be able to catch up with human beings in, ter in terms of numbers. Um, and some people still believe that what she did was heroic and, and that they died with dignity and, and honor, but it really ruined the, the race in a lot of ways. They just didn't, they were not able to rebuild from there. 
Um, and he says, do you understand why the elven and dwarven young must not be allowed to be massacred once again? Do you understand why neither you nor I are permitted to have a hand in this massacre? These roses flower all year round. They ought to have grown wild by now, but they are more beautiful than any rose in a tended garden. Elves continue to come to share to share a wed, Siri, a variety of elves, the impetuous and the foolish ones for whom the cracked stone is a symbol, as well as the sensible ones for whom these immortal forever be born flowers are a symbol. Elves who understand that if this bush is torn from the ground and the earth burned out, the roses of Sherawood will never flower again. Do you understand? Do you understand what this neutrality is? To be neutral does not mean to be indifferent. You don't have to kill your feelings. It's enough to kill hatred within yourself. Do you understand? Um, so she pricks herself and all of a sudden she knows that there is something going on with the caravan. I'm not really sure what relationship it, this has, but obviously these roses are like somehow magical. And uh, yeah, she immediately starts flipping out and is like, we need to get back right the fuck now. And when they arrive, the place is fucking on fire. People are already dead. It seems like Polly's dead, um, who is Yarpin's brother, I believe. Um, Triss is like on the ground and it says her blue dress hitched halfway up her thighs. And I really hope that that's not meant to be a, like a subtle hint that she was raped because I really do not want to think about this. Um, and the, she, she like was just recovering and got her head hit pretty badly. Like she's able to come back and take care of some other people later on. But I felt really bad for Tris. She's really being put through the ringer here, you know? Um, so as they're all like coping with this, um, let's see, there's all kinds of fighting here, but I don't have time to get into the nitty gritty of how this all happens. Um, Come on, then, you whore sons, Yarpin roared, whirling his axe. Who else? Chase the circle, Regan. Go round. Regan, tossing his bloodied mane of hair, hunched in the box amidst the whizzing of arrows, howled like the damned, and mercilessly lashed the horses on. Um, Siri was left alone. And poor Polly, um, keeping the elf charged, charging at him at bay with an axe, dragged the wounded Wenk along the ground. Um, Polly abandoned Wenk, pulled himself upright, and brandished his axe, then froze. In front of him stood a dwarf wearing a hat adorned with a squirrel's tail. So this dwarf is kind of a badass. He winds up killing Polly. Yarpin jumps in there and kills him. Um, and fighting, fighting, fighting. And finally, the last of them is killed and screams Sherawed, which now we know what that even means. Um... And when this, okay, so aid for Demaven from Airden, secret and exceptionally important aid, a convoy of special significance. It was a trap? Yes, a trap. For the squirrels? No. Polly, sobbed Regan. Polly, why? What will I tell our mother? What am I going to say to her? Um, so, Fridegard, Wenk uttered with difficulty, Fridegard, listen, you mustn't speak, said Triss severely, or move, the spell is barely holding. Fridegard, the com commissar repeated, we were wrong, everyone was wrong, it's not Yarpin, we suspected him wrongly, I vouch for him, Yarpin did not betray. Silence, shouted the knight, silence, Vilfred. Quick now, bring the stretcher. So, evidently, this knight set this shit up in order to prove that at the first provocation, Yarpin was going to abandon his loyalties to the king and side with his, quote, brethren. Well, that shit backfired. Good job, you dumbass. I hate this fuck. This damn knight. Ah. <sighs> Geralt put his arms around Ciri. Slowly, he unpinned the white rose, spattered with dark stains from her jerkin, and without a word, threw it on the squirrel's body. 
Um, so then we have the last little section here. They roam the land, importunate and insolvent, um, and insolent, sorry, nominating themselves the stalkers of evil, vanquishers of werewolves and exterminators of specters, extorting payments from the gullible and on receipt of their ignoble earnings, moving on to dispense the same deceit in the near vicinity. Um, just basically an indictment of witchers in general from Monstrum, description of the witcher. Then I have nothing against witchers. Let them hunt vampires as long as they pay taxes. Radovid the Third, the Bold, King of Redania. And then lastly, if you thirst for justice, hire a witcher. Graffiti on the wall of the Faculty of Law, University of Oxenfurt. And that is the end of the chapter. So yeah, very eventful. Um, I really feel bad for uh, Yarpin, because man... He like to be suspected after you've really betrayed your people, you know, like I don't think he's betrayed them, but they must see it that way. And to be in a position where nobody trusts you, that's got to be just hurtful, you know. So, yeah. Hashtag Team Yarvin. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you all again so much for coming. Thank you again to Melanie for uh, hanging out with me and commissioning this one. And for refreshing me on exactly what it is that our guys are doing here. I hope that you guys enjoy the coverage and I will be seeing you again soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast. Yeah.